Hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to episode number 14 of In and Around Pleasant Hill podcast with Alex Kudadat. And as always, do me a big favor, please, please share this podcast, let your friends know about us, subscribe to our podcast, and let's just get the word out there. I really, really appreciate it. I'm really excited about our interview with um, David uh, Childers today um, with Keeping Current Matter. David, how you doing? Doing great. Glad to be on, Alex. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, thank you for uh, coming on. And the title of our um, uh, podcast today is Everything You Need to Know About the Real Estate Market. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. And let's you know, tell us about you and your background, please. Yeah, Alex, I'm, I'm excited to be with you today. And thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, uh, for those maybe that haven't heard of us, I'm with Keeping Current Matters. Uh, we uh, get all of the insights, everything happening in real estate, give that to great agents like you, Alex, uh, uh, so that they can educate their clients. That's what drives us every day. So for me to get to spend a few minutes with you, uh, one of the best agents in the country, in my opinion, you know, Alex, I get to talk to a lot of different agents, but I always enjoy our time together because I know you're focused on making an impact and educating uh, people that are thinking about buying and selling homes. So uh, that's what we're all about. And, uh, you know, we've got a team here in Richmond, Virginia, that does all the research, all the writing of everything happening in real estate today. And I can even tell you a little bit of the, the story of how we were formed and what drives us here. But uh, super excited to be with you today. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, let's let's talk about it. Let's talk about you, like what inspired you? How did you even get in uh, to be involved with uh, current uh, uh, keeping current matter? And what did you do before? Sure. No, that's a, it's a great question. So, um, you know, I grew up in a house where uh, my family, my, my dad was in real estate um, as an investor. So he had a job as an engineer uh, and on the side bought some uh, rental property. And that was really his life. And, and one thing that I do remember about uh, my dad growing up is he said, whatever you do, David, don't be an engineer uh, like I was. Maybe get into real estate, get into something you're passionate about. And that kind of drove me into, into this business. You know, I've been in real estate now for 20 years um, and uh, in a number of different forms and fashions. But uh, about, gosh, 13 years ago, back in the uh, housing crisis, uh, Steve Harney was a founder of Keeping Current Matters. He wanted to help agents answer the hard questions that were in the market when back then, if you remember, there were a lot of issues in real estate. Uh, all of us that were you know, around back then uh, certainly remember that and uh, helped navigate uh, you know, a lot of the industry through that. And that's where Keeping Current Matters was formed. You know, if you were here uh, with me today in our office, we have a big wall uh, right here to my right that says, we believe every family should feel confident when buying and selling a home. So you know, over the last 13 years, that's what we've built a team that does. We go through everything in real estate, everything being published and say, okay, what is truly happening? You know, what we have a saying here, keeping current matters that headlines in the media or in the news do more to terrify people sometimes than to clarify what's really happening. So our full mission is to educate consumers that are thinking about buying and selling so that they can make a powerful and confident decision. You, you know, we've all been through a transaction before, Alex, you know, where we've bought something, we thought, wow, that was a great experience. I feel like I learned about what I was doing. I feel like I, you know, was educated in the process and made a great decision. And we've been through those experiences too, where you think, gosh, that really didn't feel good. And I spent a lot of money and I don't feel like I got the value that I wanted. And, you know, I kind of have a bad taste in my mouth. And, you know, we want to help uh, folks go through the real estate transaction and feel really, really good and educated about their decision. Yeah. You know, you were talking about being inspired by your father telling you yeah. that, you know, instead of getting into, get into real estate, actually, you know, um, in 1999, I had already uh, built a successful business. Like I told you in the early nineties, I came to, um, Virginia, I was there yeah. for two weeks. I watched the movie Godfather. It inspired me. So I saw this kid coming to America and it kind of had, you know, as like me as a child coming to America mm -hmm. and how successful he became. And I was like, I got to do this. So anyways, by 1999, I had done very well for myself. But then I met another friend of mine that had done very well. And I said, hey, you know, give me some tips. He's like, hey, there's a few books here I want you to read. And one of them was Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. That yeah. book literally... I read that book in 1999 and I bought my first investment in 1999. I never forget Great. it. 
it was April 15 on tax day. It was a duplex that I bought. And, and from the beginning, he thought, you know, he kept saying, you know, buy the four greenhouses and go into the red hotel. And that's the thing is for me, I've always seen real estate as a vehicle for building my wealth. And it's done very, very well for me. So that's good that your father, you know, I didn't have a father growing up. So kind of like one of my biggest mentor was Robert Kiyosaki. I actually met him once and that book truly inspired me. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm grateful for it. And I think, you know, anybody listening probably has the, the inspirations they've had as well. And uh, I, I, you know, I think a lot about that, about my dad saying, don't do this because he wasn't passionate about it. Now I'm grateful for his sacrifice and everything he did uh, in that, but it, it certainly directed me towards an area that I'm passionate about. And, right. uh, you, you know, it's interesting as you talk about being in business, I, I've been in real estate for 20 years, but prior to that, um, in college, I worked for an author named John Maxwell, who's a leadership author. Wow. Um, great book recommendation. If you've never read it, The 21 Laws of Leadership, probably one of the best leadership books I've ever written. But, you know, the idea that you can you know, work hard and do something, become something and, and actually get better at it, become a better leader, become a better investor, become a better, uh, you, you, know, um, you know, student of your craft is certainly something that, that early on. I'm grateful to have been exposed to. Um, and so, so for that, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll always be indebted. But, you know, even in today, in, in today's real estate market, I think sometimes, Alex, you know, in, in what we're going to talk about today, it's hard for some people to understand what is really going on. And, and that's where we want to help people that, that want to educate themselves uh, know, you know, what choices should they make in real estate? Right. Now, you know, the 2008 left a kind of a bad taste. Sure. Um, and, and and especially you know the generation X and then the millennials back then they weren't really there to buy and they saw that and their 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 mindset you know they are coming into the market they are buying right now but what are you seeing like you know for us out here um, you know because you guys have the pulse on the market and we also have a pulse on the market here in California I actually tell people I say California is kind of like the atomic bomb like this bomb just exploded and it's got a ripple effect across the country like where everywhere home values have gone up because every lot of people are leaving California and going to other states and what have you. But this thing about where people are sitting on the sideline and saying, ah, you know what, the market's going to crash. Yep. 2008 is going to repeat itself. We got 4 million people that are forbearance or 2 million or 3 million or whatever. And thanks to you, actually, you know, all the uh, deep dives that you've done, especially last year, me and my team, we were zoomed in and all your deep dives and we would sit there and listen. Yes, I know it's national, but yeah. it's still the principle is the, still the principle. So um, what is your take on that? Like with these folks that's sitting around saying that the market's going to crash, I'm going to wait for the market to crash. Yeah. So let me back up. Let me answer a couple of questions in that, because I think it is a question that, you know, people that live through 2008, they're going, you know, this feels a lot like that. I don't think that's a uh, you know, a sort of a crazy question to ask. I think there are a lot of people that, that wonder that. I want to be real clear on the front end. We don't see anything similar to 2008 happening in real estate today. Now, there's, there's some things we want to watch and we want to look at. I mean, prices certainly are, are growing out of control. Alex, you mentioned the state of California where you're at. Uh, it's certainly a leading state. I mean, one of the largest economies in the world, first of all, but not, not alone you know, in the United States, but um, certainly a leader uh, in real estate. But I want to be very clear. What was happening in 2008 is not what was, is happening today. I can tell you right now, Demand was inflated uh, back in 2008 because people were giving loans that they couldn't, uh, you know, substantiate and ultimately afford a home. And, you know, it, it, at the same time, builders had overbuilt. We had a tremendous amount of supply in this country, and we know how that all turned out. Um, so as we look at today, people that say, you know, I don't know if I want to buy right now. It feels like I may be at the top of the market. That's what I want to speak to. So let me let me give you a little facts and figures. You know, I'm gonna I'm gonna kind of walk through this. I know we'll be some of you listening to it, Alex. I am gonna share a couple of slides. So if people want to look at the slides, I'll give them to you, Alex. They they can reach out to you and get them. I know they can go to YouTube and view this. Uh, you, you know, if they want to as well. But but let me kind of break down what's happening in prices. And I'm going to give you one visual that probably is the best explainer of why we're in the situation we're in in real estate today. 
So, so if we look at pricing right now, Case Shiller just came out and said homes have appreciated year over year. So think about that. You know, this time a year ago, since then, 19.7 percent. That's 20 percent appreciation in real estate, residential real estate in one year. That's a tremendous amount of appreciation. That's not something that's sustainable in housing long term. It's something that a lot of experts are like, ah, I'm concerned about that. Don't see a crash, but but are concerned. Um, and, and so that's where we sit in appreciation. Now, two things I want to, um, to, to bring into uh, perspective there. When I look out about what experts are saying about that, a couple of things. The second half of the year, and we're now in the fourth quarter of this year, experts are forecasting for appreciation to slow. A couple of reasons for that. One, prices are going up, interest rates are going up, and more inventory is coming to market. Now, I, I don't say that to say, don't expect to walk out of your house on your home search tomorrow and find homes everywhere. There's still multiple offer scenarios. Don't be fooled by that, but more inventory is coming into the market. Builders are building. Those that didn't sell in the last year are selling, and there will be people affected by the pandemic that will put their homes on the market. So those uh, certainly are happening. But but let me tell you what I, I think is about to happen with pricing. And this is where people may get concerned, is we'll end up actually in a what's called a, or what I would call a decelerating market relative to appreciation. So if you think about deceleration is we were at 19.7%. So we're going to start coming down in appreciation, not depreciation. Let me be really clear, Alex. No depreciation is forecast, but, but starting to see less appreciation. Now, if I want to put 20% into perspective, the average for the last 20 years is about 3.8% appreciation in residential real estate. So expect to see headlines, expect to see things like appreciation in real estate is slowing. Well, that's not a bad thing. We don't want to see 20% appreciation every year. But, but do expect appreciation to slow off of those highs. Now, the reason we're in this situation, I'm gonna pause here for a second, Alex, is because we have a lack of available homes on the market for the number of people that wanna buy them. So think about anything you would go out and sell. When do you ever wanna sell it? Well, you always wanna sell what you have when there are fewer of those items on the market. Why? Because that drives the price up. It's simple economics at that point. And that's what's happening in real estate. But I'll pause for a second, Alex. I, I want to show a slide here in a minute that really kind of kind of sums that up. But tell me what questions you have uh, about what I just said. No, I mean, yeah, I, I agree 100%. I mean, like even last year, I remember when we went into lockdown and all, the whole all of our team, we would get on Zoom and we would watch you on every Monday. And yeah. you guys kept saying, look, the market's going to go up. I mean, and there was people out there, especially the news. I mean, they they, they drive on negativity. Like, you know, they just want to sell negative, negative. Oh, the market's going to drop. It's going to do this. In California, in the Bay Area, last year, home values went up 24%. I had a client, we bought him a house for 900000 And this year, he sold it for $1.4 million. He made $400,000 and wow. after paying commission and everything. And one year, and wow. one year, I mean, for those that, you know, for those that knew that, that the market, uh, it was time to dive in, they dived in. And especially with, with, you know, with keeping current matter and with you guys' knowledge of kept saying, look, the market is going to be strong. The market is going to be strong. You know, I heard you, my team heard you, but some of those consumers, they're like, you see, I told you the market is going to crash and it didn't crash. And yeah. now they're saying again, it's going to crash and it's not going to crash. So, yeah, so I, I don't have any question. That was more of a statement, but but I agree with you. I mean, it's not, but the way the media will just say it, they'll say the market is going to drop. Yeah, it's going to drop from maybe 20% appreciation to maybe five, six, 7% appreciation. There's still going to be home values are still going to keep going up. Yeah, I think the, you know, without getting on a rant about the media and different things like that, you have to understand one thing. The job of the news in this country or the job of media Yep. is to get you to watch more news. That's right. That's their job. That's what they're trying to do. Yep. And, and you know, Alex, they don't do that by saying, 
hey, guess what? Everything in the world's going good. And let's talk about all the great things. They do that by scaring us where we go, I better tune in tomorrow to find out what's ha what happens here. And yeah. it's just understanding that. So let me give you a couple of things. If you're thinking about buying right now, I want to talk specifically to you because there are many people that, again, let's go back to what, how we started this, Alex. Do I want to buy at the quote, top of the market. Now I'm going to tell you, I don't, I don't see this being the top of the market, but I do think there are a lot of people that think that, and I do want to address that and validate that. If, if I wasn't in the real estate business, I might think this is the top of the market, you know, based on what I've seen. So let me give you a couple of visuals. Again, if, you, if you're listening to this, uh, you can get these visuals from Alex. Uh, he can share them with you, but I'll walk you through them. The first one is a look at single family housing units completed going all the way back to the 70s. So think about this as builds, new builds, whether they be a, a home, a town home, whatever the case may be, these are single family housing units completed all the way back to the 70s. Now, what do you see here? You, you, you see kind of in the middle there, the red bars, that was a housing crisis. There were four years, consecutive years, of record setting number of units built. Three of those four years, there were over a million and a half homes built in this country. That's never happened before and has never happened since. Tremendous amount of supply leading up to the housing crisis. And we know what happened there. Oversupply in the market, prices drop. What I say before, whenever you wanna sell something, you wanna do that when there are fewer that item on the market. And that's what we have going on right now. Well, what else stands to you? sends out to you. The last 13 years, we've been below the 50-year average of new builds in this country. Back in the housing crisis, the hardest hit area of our business was builders. Builders had gone out and, you know, taken, uh, you know, bought land and got ready to develop it, build homes, and were wiped out. There were a lot of builders back in the crisis, Alex, that, that said, I've got to go figure out something else to do because, I can't be a builder anymore. Nobody's buying these newly built homes. And so we haven't had the demand, nor have we had the, the, um, the ability to go out and build these homes that we need to build since the housing crisis. And, and oh, by the way, in the 70s and 80s in this country, there were more homes built than there were in the last 10 years. Think about that. Population has certainly exploded during that time. Population has grown, yet we haven't built the number of homes for the number of people that want to buy them. That's the reason we're in the situation we're in with prices, simply a supply and demand issue. And now, can, I ask you, can I ask you a quick question? Why are the developers, the builders have stopped building like they used to build? And that, like, since the, th is it because of what happened in the crash of 2008? Absolutely. So let me, let's, let's break that down. It's a great question. So back in 2008, we know it was a real estate and the mortgage crisis. Our, our industry, you know, home building and, and uh, lending was at the center of uh, the crisis. Now, if you want to go to really what the center of that was, it was builders. Now, if you think about the housing crisis, that was based on a lot of speculation, Meaning builders would go out and buy these lots and they'd say, we're going to build all these houses. Remember what I said on the front end? Infl uh, demand was inflated because people were getting loans that they probably otherwise shouldn't have gotten because of no verification of their income or assets or anything like that. So you have inflated demand. You have these builders trying to build to meet that demand. And then the air in the balloon comes out, lending standards change. And all of a sudden you have all these homes on the market and nobody to buy them. Yep. Now let's, let's kind of play this out because there, there's also a silver lining to this. If you play this out, builders were hit very hard. You know, if you were to walk in a bank in 2009 and say, Hey, I just bought a lot or I have a lot and I want to build a home on it. We just need a construction loan. They would have run you out of the place. Yep. They didn't have construction loans weren't available back in, 09, 2010, kind of the years coming out of the housing crisis because banks were like, we got enough of that. We, we, even, we don't if need <laughs> and even if they were available, home values had dropped so much, it was better to buy something that was already built than to build from, it would have cost you more money. Absolutely. So, so you have a, a, a huge amount of supply on the market. Builders don't need to build. And oh, by the way, when builders aren't building, let's just bring it down to simple 
economics, Alex, if you have a situation where you can't do your business, you got to figure something else out to feed your family. Yep. And building is not a business where you decide tomorrow I'm going to be a builder. It's a trade. You've got to learn it. You've got to grow. You've got, you've got to be able to, to, to grow in that profession. So you can't just turn that on and become a builder the next day. So that takes time to get these builds back. Now, I'll tell you what absolutely builders know right now. They know it's a great time to be a builder. And they're building houses as fast as they can. Had trouble with lumber this year. Lumber prices are coming down, which is a good thing. Having trouble with labor. You know, there are headwinds for builders, but they're trying to build homes as fast as they can. But that's the reason that we're, uh, we're in the situation we're in. And, um, you know, as we build more homes and we get, uh, you know, caught up on that in the next few years, I think you'll see more what I'm going to call a normalized market. So let me talk to that because I want to go back to that earlier, uh, you know, point that we made. Do I want to buy at the top of the market? Let me show you right now what experts are forecasting for home price appreciation for the next five years, because that, that's going to give us the, 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 the ultimate answer of the question. Don't just listen to me about are we at the top of the market? So this is estimated home price performance for the next five years going all the way to 2020, 2025 from the home price expectation survey. This is a collection of housing economists that get together and they forecast home prices. This year, total appreciation 11.74%. I think they're a little low on that. I think it's gonna come in a little bit higher. Next year, 5.8%, we'll call that 6%. And then 23, 24, 25, um, a little over, you know, 3%, some 3.5% uh, in more average, I'm going to call it appreciation. That's what experts are forecasting. So if you look at that, I can tell you because our team has done the numbers on the average priced home. Now, this is not a price point where, where you're at and probably a lot of folks are listening, uh, Alex, but on an average priced home of $350,000, the appreciation someone uh, stands to gain in equity is a little over $100,000 in the next five years. Yep. Let's not forget the, the amount of the payment that you're making, the principal portion of it. You're actually building that wealth in there too versus if you're renting and you throw it in the garbage. You know? No doubt. Listen, First American came out with a study about a month ago where in, listen to this, every major city in this country, every major city, when you factor in the price of a mortgage payment and listen, an equity that you gain, it's cheaper to buy than rent anywhere. Yeah. You got to factor in equity because you just made that point. When you add equity in, which, oh, by the way, is real money, it's cheaper to buy than rent in every single city in this country, including uh, your market, Alex, including some of the markets that go, well, what about... Uh, you know, Chicago and New York and San Francisco, all the high price markets, San Diego, it's cheaper to buy today than to rent. Now, David, what about interest rates? Do you have a, do you guys have a, a you know, a, a indication of where the rates are going to be going in the next couple of years or next yeah, year? I can tell you where, where experts are forecasting. We're right yeah. now at about 3% on the average 30 year fixed. Last week was 3.05%. Experts are saying by the middle of next year, it'd be about three and a half percent. I think we're on our way to 4%. You know, if you think about this logically, the, uh, you know, the pandemic hits, the yep. Fed has to act. They can influence rates. They don't control rates. But that drove the, the average 30-year fixed rate down. As, we, as the economy recovers, and we are recovering, we are coming out of all of this, um, expect to see higher interest rates because that's a sign of a growing and thriving economy. Now, one thing I'm noticing with building, um, especially in California, I don't know what it is in the East Coast, we're seeing a lot of multi-use where it's commercial in the bottom and condos on the top. We're not seeing in California, and especially around here, as much single family resident. We're seeing a lot of okay. condos. Do you know anything? I mean, can you tell us a little bit about that, the whole multi-use? I, I think you're going to see a lot more high density um, housing developments. And, and there are a couple of reasons for that. What I say before, we don't have the number of units that we need to keep up with the population growth. So what do you have to do that? You have to then build 
uh, housing that can accommodate more people. So I think you're absolutely right in seeing multifamily, seeing duplexes, seeing, you know, um, even folks that want to live in a walkable community, like you mentioned, where there's there's uh, residential uh, above and, you know, business and, and things commerce below. So I think you will see more and more of that uh, happening all across the country, not just something that's in California. Now, what about forbearance? You know, really quickly, um, you know, you're already, um, we're already getting emails, hey, you need to sign up to be a foreclosure prevention expert and mm -hmm. you know that it's gloom and doom and it's coming to an end. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with, do you guys have stats right now? Like how many people in this country are on forbearance and now that it, it was up last month or evictions, you know, they can start that now. I mean, what, yeah. what is the data on that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, right now, let me back up and kind of tell you what forbearance is at. 2.62% of mortgages are in forbearance. Think about that, a little over a million mortgages. The actual height of it back in May of last year was about eight and a half percent. Very, very different from what, um, you know, experts forecasted. When they originally forecasted forbearance, they said 30% of mortgages were going to go into forbearance and every one of them was going to be a foreclosure. Um, and, and certainly not the case. Now, what you really want to start to look at, and I'll show you a visual here uh, on this, Alex, is what's happening to those as they come out of forbearance. That's what we really want to watch. Yep. And this is as of October 3rd. You see the pie graph uh, there on the screen. Let's kind of break this down. This, this is everybody who's come off of forbearance. The green portion, 40.8%. They've been paid in full. And they, they didn't need it, Alex. Now, I'm not I'm not saying they didn't they took it and they took it incorrectly, but they you know probably were small business owners, folks like that that said, I don't know what tomorrow is going to hold and I'm going to take it if they're going to give it to me. And that was yep. a wise decision. But they paid their money off. Yeah. Forty percent. Forty one percent. Forty one point four to be exact went through a, a, a workout with their bank, either a modification. Think about that. A rate and term refinance or a loan deferral where they say, okay, this is your forbearance amount and payments you missed. We're going to tack it onto the end of the mortgage. That was another 40%. So the, the, the bottom line of this, Alex, is four out of five people that are coming out of forbearance didn't even need it. They're good. I, I, they're, they're not in trouble. This isn't some wave of you know, troubled uh, you know, assets and troubled homeowners that are coming to the market. Now, there is a, 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 a area of this in red there that 17.9% are still in some form of trouble. Either they don't have a, a plan or they're already in some kind of deed in lieu or short sale. Now, the interesting thing about this, to put it into perspective, um, experts have kind of you know, judged this to be somewhere in the neighborhood of about 300,000 uh, homes and individuals across the country. Now, I'm not saying this isn't a crisis for them. If you're in that situation, I feel for you. I would tell you to, to, to reach out to Alex and his team, talk to them, because here's the difference today versus um, uh, 2008. There are options in the market today. If, if, you're, if you're somebody that's you know, struggling in this area and, and you're in a situation where you may have to sell your home, you can sell it and likely sell it above list price, pay a commission, put a little bit of money in your pocket and get you and your family to the other side of the crisis that you're facing. That's what my hope is uh, for everyone. And Alex, I know it's yours as well. Right, but right. if you think about folks being affected, and I'll give you a little bit of perspective on the numbers. I, I gave you, you know, that um, uh, experts have said it's about 300,000. Now, I'm not saying all of those are going to go into foreclosure. Don't hear me say that. Those are the ones that are still in trouble. A portion of those will go into foreclosure. Back in the housing crisis, 9.3 million people went into foreclosure. So nowhere near what it was back then. But again, I want to acknowledge if somebody's in that situation, that is a crisis uh, for you and for your family. And I feel for you in that. And the, and the good news is relative to your housing, there are options today. Uh, and if there is a, you know, a shining star from 2008, uh, Alex, it is equity in people's homes. You know, back in 2008, everybody was pulling money out, going on vacation, buying jet skis, living life, whatever they were doing. And people largely since then have said, we're going to handle things differently this time. 
And we don't want to the difference. People. And another thing too, we need to keep in mind is that there's this huge transfer of wealth yeah. between the baby boomers passing away and as money's coming to Generation X or millennials. So even for some of those folks that are making great money, but don't have a big down payment, they're going to be like right now, when we put a listing on the market, we're seeing some folks that are coming in with a half a million because they just inherited from grandma or yeah, from yeah. mom or what have you. So that, that's, I think that's a, and it would be nice if there was some sort of a stat on that too. Uh, but I think for the next, they say, I don't know, 10 years or so, there's going to be this almost a trillion dollars worth of transfer every year that's going to be going from one hand to another. I believe it. I, I believe it. I think it makes a lot of sense. And I think that will happen um, in that. So, you, you know, as you look out across uh, real estate right now, what, what we need are more, uh, uh, you know, more, more homes on the market. Builders are going to build those. There are a lot of people right now that are thinking, you know, I'll give you a couple of stats as well. In the last year, the average home has gained uh, about $50,000 in equity on average. Now, Alex, again, we, we talk about where you're at in the rest of the country, that's a lot more for a lot of people listening to this. And a lot of people are thinking, maybe I have a second home, maybe I have another home that I want to now uh, put on the market. And I think you're going to see a lot of people doing that and uh, right. taking advantage of that and using that money to start a business, send a child to school, whatever the case may be uh, yep. in, uh, in doing that. So David, is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we go? You know, uh, I'm listen, Alex, I'm grateful to be on with you. I said before, I consider you and your team to be the best, uh, the best at helping people uh, navigate the transaction, the best at educating those that are thinking about buying and selling a home, the, the best really out there in real estate. So for me, it's an honor to be on with you. I'm grateful to count you as a friend and count you as somebody too, that I can get good advice from, uh, you know, as we're, as we're making decisions about what we research. So know that I'm grateful for, for our relationship and grateful for you helping us get the word out about uh, what's happening in real estate today. Absolutely. And for, um, you know, I have a lot of colleagues that are in real estate also too, as realtors. Um, if they wanted to get involved with you guys, I mean, you, you just you go to your website or how do they sign up so they can take advantage of your content and your yeah. lives and all that good stuff? No, I appreciate it. You can go to keepingcurrentmatters.com uh, and you can sign up for a free 14 day trial and get all this information. We do it for $29 a month uh, and agents can grab that every every Monday morning at 11 a.m. I do the deep dive. You know that, Alex. And yep. Uh, we go over a topic like this. Love to have anybody on there. Uh, yeah, more more. we love it. We love it. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, uh, folks, do me a favor again. Please go ahead and share this video if you're watching it on YouTube. And also um, share this podcast with uh, family and friends. We really appreciate it. Um, until next time, talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.